Okay, hi everyone. I am Veronica Schmidt. Um, if you Google me, you'll most likely see that I'm mostly referred to in the hacker community as V. I am an assistant professor at North University and Christian Sant in Norway, but I originate from South Africa. Um, I've had a implanted cardiac device since the age of 19. So one can say that this is very much very close to my heart. Um, so today I have the privilege to tell you a little bit about myself. I have two little girls. I'm looking to study my PhD with Nathan being my supervisor, which I'm super excited to do. I'm also a security researcher for a medical company in the United States, the one that created mine. Uh, if you buy me a coffee, I'll tell you that interesting story on how that came to be. But I'm very passionate when it comes to law medical devices and patient safety. Now today we're gonna talk about a recent case that I consulted on, which was a first in my career. I've been around the block for a couple of years, but this was the first time that we had a case that solely relied on the data of the victim's um, ICD. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the case background because we need to understand the case that we had to examine and analyze. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the timeline because our whole case you know, rested on exactly getting the time right. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the device and then we're gonna chat a little bit about legalities surrounding using medical devices within criminal matters. And now I was contacted by the defense team in the US to be an expert for them in terms of actually analyzing the data from an ICD. Uh, they were recommended to come to me from the manufacturer as again, this is something I've been talking about a lot. As this being a murder case as ex-law enforcement agent, I was hesitant at first to take on the case because defense cases are a little bit, an ethical gray zone sometimes. Um, I have a single rule. I will take on defense cases. However, I will examine the evidence and I will be brutally honest. So I normally ask people whether they are guilty or innocent as it is going to come out in the end. The case that I'm going to be explaining to you today is a murder case. It was alleged that our suspect shot the victim at approximately between 10 a.m. and 10.48 in the morning. Um, this date and time was, um, was given by the medical examiner in their testimony. Um, our victim was found in the back of, of his own stolen vehicle, and that is where the suspect was um, arrested. He was driving the victim's vehicle, which doesn't paint a good picture for his innocence or guilt, but as a digital forensic practitioner, you are not there to determine the guilt or the innocence of anyone that is up to the courts. We are there to present the evidence truthfully and factually. The medical examiner, while doing the autopsy, found that the victim had an implanted cardiac device. It was initially identified to be a pacemaker, which was incorrect as a pacemaker only has two leads and the victim had three on the x-rays, which leads you to believe that it is a heart failure device or a implanted defibrillator. Now we had information from the GPS ankle bracelet that the suspect was wearing. So it, you can have a bias that comes in when you read the case background on the suspect that he's potentially not a good guy and potentially is guilty. And that is a bias that any forensics person will tell you that we need to be wary about because that can cloud your judgment. Now, the defense team disputed the time of death, which was somewhere between 10 a.m. and 10.48 a.m. due to the reason that the GPS ankle bracelet placed the person, the suspect, in a different location um, in that time frame. However, the prosecution being the prosecution was fairly certain with their bias that the person was guilty and therefore kind of picked the heel that they wanted to stay upon. And it was my job to factually review it for both sides and determine exactly what was plausible to have taken place. The window of when the shooting occurred was very uncertain at this point. There was obviously an estimate, but nothing definitive. Now, the evidence items I was given to review was a GPS ankle bracelet coordinates and logs that was 
confirmed to be accurate from the law enforcement agents responsible for it. I was given an implanted cardiac report, which if you have an ICD or pacemaker, this is the report that is pulled off that physicians use to adjust your treatment or see whether or not you've had any arrhythmias or events where you had to have therapies. I also had the medical examiner report and some CCTV footage of the crime scene, as well as CCTV footage placing the suspect in a different location. My job was to review the timeline and to answer specific questions. Now, if we look at the timeline, which is at, um, according to the pacemaker report itself or the ICD report itself, we found that the victim had what is called a automatic mode switching episode event that lasted about 20 minutes in duration. Now that is generally used to treat atrial fibrillation, which means that the heart is not contracting in a normal way, which is generally very severe. And it's the main purpose he had the ICD. Now, shortly after that 20 minute span at 9.42, so approximately there's a minute in between, we saw that the patient, the victim had a superventricular um, event. Now, this event lasted for a minute 41 seconds and two shocks were administered. Now, when you look at the ECG specifically, you will see that there is a break in the electrical conductivity that confirms that the device was administering a shock. Now, you might say, how do we know that this data is factually correct? Um, a little later on, I'll tell you that it is as accurate as we will receive um, due to our sequence of events that have taken place surrounding this device specifically. But an ICD and a pacemaker will record approximately six months worth of data within its locally stored memory, which means that a physician or a digital forensic practitioner can take this information and reconstruct about six months worth of information. Now, the, the events that we are looking at is on the day that the victim was shot and found um, dead. Now, initially the medical examiner estimated that the time of death according to the implanted cardiac device was at 10 a.m. However, as we know that there isn't really a lot of even academic resources or case precedents where implanted cardiac devices was used to confirm a time of death um, and liver temperature is still widely used in the global industry to determine this. This placed the time of death to approximately between 1008 and 1048. So for this purposes, we're going to say from 10 to 1048 because that was the window we focused on. Now, when liver temperature is taken in terms of forensic sciences, the medical examiner needs to actually document the environmental factors. This includes how warm it was, how humid it was, and where the victim was found. A lot of this information was not found, and this often happens in criminal matters, and the liver temp became a point of contention where we couldn't verify that that window was accurate. But due to the fact that there's no precedent set and there's not a lot of literature that supports the use of a implanted device in terms of time of death, uh, it becomes a little bit complicated in terms of um, what is accurate and what is not. Now, if we further dive into the events that was noted, we see that at 928, there are some things that happen. Now, I'll try and explain the medical side. Um, I was able to testify to some of these things due to the experience that I have um, in terms of arrhythmias, being a patient since the age of 19, as well as doing extensive research in the cardiac field. I was able to testify as an expert um, in terms of what this means from the report. Now, what we see is with atrial fibrillation, your atrial and your ventricular chambers are actually beating not in synchronization, but asynchronously. So your heart almost vibrates. Now, what happened in this case is he had a huge atrial spike at 640 beats per minute. And yes, you might tell me, well, Veronica, that's super high, but that is quite common in atrial fibrillations that for a few seconds, the heart rate will peak that high. And then what happens, the device will take over and it will bring it down. Now, as you can see, there is quite a significant difference between the atrial and ventricular rates that have happened, but it is higher than what we estimate or would like to see a normal patient to have. 
Now, the duration is super important specifically for this case is because it gives us a timeline of how long this patient was in automatic mode switching therapy. Now, if you take that time and you add it to when it started, it gives us a start and an end date. So it helps us complete the timeline of exactly what has taken place. Now, shortly after that, you see at 9.42 that the patient or the victim had a superventricular tachycardia attack. And this, this specifically means that it was within the rhythm again after it receives um, the shock and treatment. It temporarily for about a minute 42 went back into uh, ventricular tachycardia. And that was about a minute and 41 seconds. We see what the detection criteria is set at and see that the victim's heart rate was at about 206 beats per minute. Now, I think everyone can agree that that is fairly high and shows that something happened under duress. What happened, we don't know, but we've now got a window that the heart is showing us through the medical device that the victim was under duress. Now, it took the device a further 38 0.5 seconds to diagnose this and apply therapy. So one can take it from the initial time that we had, the 921 plus the 20 minutes plus the 38 seconds, and one will then get around 942 or just shy of that, which shows us that the timeline is starting to unfold. We see the two shocks were applied, one for four milliseconds and one for three. So we now have a better idea of what happened to the heart. Now, the questions that the specific prosecution and defense team asked me to answer is, well, how reliable are dates and times on implant devices? Is there a way that the device can accurately detect the time of death? Um, was the correct process followed by the medical examiner and those involved in the case? And this was a question specifically from the magistrate or the judge, depending on which legal system you're in, because uh, he wanted to understand exactly what the recommended process is. They wanted to further know how accurate the data is that we are looking at from the manufacturer. But I was also asked to estimate according to the timeline a window for the time of death to have taken place. So let's talk a little bit about dates and times, specifically on cardiac or implanted devices. And this does include your insulin pumps, your deep brain stimulators, or any pacemaker or ICD. Now, if I'm asked the question, are these dates and times accurate? The literature, as well as the engineering practices, will tell you, no, they are not. Um, the reason being is that these devices don't have any mechanism to maintain and control an accurate date and time. There are two dates and times when dealing with implants. You have a real world date and time as well as the true system date and time. Now, these are fairly different. The one is an updated internal clock that is corresponded with external sources and constantly updated. The other one is the date and time according to the device. So in terms of the date and time, which the defense was heavily reliant on for their case, there was a lot of questions placed on the legalities and whether or not we should use it. Now, if you only looked at the literature and the engineering practices and spoken to those that have built the device, you will get the finding that no, there is no way for it to tell time. However, this is where creative thinking and a little bit of knowledge on how these devices work comes into play and having a little bit of a legal background. Now, before we carry on, the FDA, as well as the UK Medical Advisory, anyone that approves a medical device, has certain requirements for dates and times being accurate or as accurate as possible. Now, when it comes to these specific implants, they have a way of maintaining dates. Now, there's two things that occur with a date and time. Initially, when the patient or the victim received their device, it was on the 18th of June. This was the first time that that device that was in the victim was programmed to have a date and time. And this is correlated by external systems and via the programmer that assigns that date and time. 
Now, the second component where these dates and times are updated is when an ICD or pacemaker is connected to a programmer. So when a patient goes and visits a physician or a cardiologist, it will update it. Now, one needs to understand what a programmer is from. It is the device that potentially runs Linux or Windows most of the time, but it is the device that is responsible for interpreting the data on the device, visualizing it for the physician and making specific changes. Now, does this mean that the date and time is accurate? Well, it depends, because if you know a little bit about engineering and embedded systems, you know that if there is no mechanism for an internal clock, you will have clock drift. Um, so over a time period, the clock will drift and your date and time may become inaccurate. Now, what is a clock drift? Now, the clock drift refers specifically to engineered devices or embedded systems that have no mechanism of telling an internal date and time. This means that over a time period, there becomes discrepancies between when the device was set and the actual device time, which means we lose time effectively. However, as I said, medical devices have to be compliant to regulatory processes. Therefore, they have to match certain parameters. So they will synchronize the clock either when it's implanted with a programmer or a home monitor. Those devices have internal clocks and can confirm with external sources. So you need to think of medical devices in terms of an ecosystem. I myself have an ecosystem at home. I have my home monitor, I have my phone, I have my device that are all connected. When I go to my physician, the program is connected and that is when the date and time is updated. Now, as you saw earlier, um, the April before June where the victim passed away, sadly, the device was programmed at the physician's office. Now, this would mean that the date was updated if significant clock drift was identified. Another mechanism that these devices have that is potentially super cool is what's called a precision quartz oscillator, which allows them to maintain an accurate enough time. Now, I was further asked to elaborate on this, and if you do understand these devices and you've read the manuals and you've read submissions from regulatory bodies specifically for these devices, um, you will see that as far as possible in cardiac devices, as well as insulin pumps, as well as deep brain simulators, they try and avoid clock drift by all costs. And the reason that they actually try to have this is because the date and time is often used to be associated with um, therapies that are given. I apologize, they are drilling here. Uh, I'm going to do my best to speak super loudly. So if we think and consider that an average cardiac device or deep brain stimulator lasts for approximately 15 years these days, and you can assume that according to all the studies and research that have been done, that the clock drift is at most a one millisecond over a 12-month period if the device is never programmed or connected to a home monitor. This means that Essentially, the clock drift that we can expect in a cardiac device is minimal and not of any consequence to be majorly out. Now, let's say hypothetically, because we play devil's advocate often, that the date and time was out significantly. Because patients go in approximately twice a year, this would mean that that was updated um, at least twice for the year, previously a few months before the patient passed away. So if we go back to the timeline now that we've confirmed that the date and time on the device is fairly accurate, we will start to see a whole different picture. We see that on the 18th of June, 2018, at 12.45, the device was implanted. So this is our first true date and time. Um, we then further see that the 22nd of April, 2022, now the, you know, the client, the victim passed away in June, we saw that the device was interrogated, you know, five minutes to nine, which means that the date and time would have been synced again. So our second true date and time. And then on the day in question at 921, we had our first event that lasted 20 minutes. 
then shortly after our second and final event that lasted for what, approximately one minute, um, and shortly after that, the device noted the last electrical activity on the device. Now, we will talk about that a little later. As the question is asked, can these devices actually tell you when a patient has died? Now, according to the GPS information that we were given, our suspect was only placed at the crime scene at 1048. Whilst this is still well within the time frame that the medical examiner gave, there are questions as to why there is such a large gap between the device and what the medical examiner and GPS places the person. Now, if you look at this, you'll start to see that there is a potential here that our client was not involved in the shooting. Now, on the 9th of June at six o'clock at night, our suspect was arrested with the body in the back of the vehicle that he allegedly stole. Now, is this a case of bad luck or is this a case of a criminal telling a smart story to try and throw the police off. But the inevitable finding on this was that the date and time on this device, if we are gracious and worst case scenario would be 15 seconds time discrepancy, would is the worst that I've seen across a 15 years lifespan. This is really non-significant and shouldn't be considered as having any merit within this case. Now, the question that followed shortly after was, well, okay, you say that the patient or the victim died at 10 o'clock according to the device. Can this device actually tell the time of death? Now, if you've been in digital forensics or you have worked in incident response, you know that the golden standard here is it depends. It depends on the situations around it. It depends on the definition of time of death. Now, whilst it is possible to use a pacemaker and ICD to provide the information about what we refer to as when electrical signals ceased in the heart, um, this isn't the true time of death. This is simply when the heart stopped beating. There is no way for these devices to smartly read the signals or patterns and to determine that the patient died. However, when electrical activity within the heart ceases, one has got a non-sustainable beat. Small differences, but they are important to note. Now, if we look at the device itself and what it is responsible for doing, an ICD is a very special device that helps people regulate their heartbeat or helps people that's heart stop, like mine. It administers electrical shocks. Now, in addition to monitoring the heart, like I said, it gives the shocks and we have noted in the um, information from the device that the patient received two shocks. Um, and then we shortly after that saw no further electrical activity. Now, the question can be asked whether those shocks were the electrical activity that we saw. And that is a question that an electrophysiologist will need to answer as it's outside the scope of this conversation and my experience. Now, if we look at a pacemaker and ICDs, they do have limited amounts of data. They are binary devices. They are much like memory on machines. They retain only certain information. But it does record specific information about the heart's electrical activity, timing, and duration of certain events. So indeed, if you take into account that, and the information that it gives, we can build circumstantial evidence that allows us to consider that potentially when the electrical signal ceased. Now, one needs to understand that to get the precise time of death, there are many other factors that need to happen. You need to take into account the type of disease that the patient has this device for, how it has been set, and things like that. Then you have to confirm with things like, was there rigor mortis? What was the liver mortis saying? What's the body temperature? And a whole lot of other things. And this is why the medical examiner placed it between 10 and 10.48 as the big um, potential time of death. Was this incorrect? No, that is the forensic science process. And that is about correlating and finding the most accurate window. Now, if one puts everything together, one finds that the window is slightly off in its consideration, um, whilst minuscule, but in this case, a few minutes makes a huge difference. 
Now, one of the things that we need to understand and ask is, well, was the correct process followed? What happened is the medical examiner called in the manufacturer, which is the standard process because this is a device that is not handled by the medical examiner's office or law enforcement. Um, the data is removed, i.e. the reports are pulled. These are PDF reports that are supplied to the medical examiner and the devices are inevitably destroyed. And now when you think about digital forensics, we don't destroy evidence. We will, we will acquire the evidence, we will preserve the evidence, and we will follow chain of custody processes as well as we will store it for the defense to have the capabilities to review and examine the evidence for themselves. Now, in this case, the manufacturer got involved, which made things a little convoluted and a little bit difficult. Um, as the device was also destroyed, we generally had a single report that we needed to handle this. Now, I'm going to get questions on why was the device destroyed? Well, they didn't act any in any abnormal fashion due to the fact that this is kind of the process that is often followed. When a regular person from natural circumstances passes away, whether in the UK, EU or US, this device is returned to the manufacturer. And there are some reasons for it. One of those is that it's not accidentally cremated with the body due to the fact that it containing a high power battery and can cause explosions. It also deals with a whole host of different information. Now, so let's look at exactly why this medical device was destroyed. Because inevitably, in a criminal matter, we don't want evidence to be destroyed. However, there was no malice from the medical device company. Now, medical devices are classified as medical waste, which is regulated in most countries, the UK being no different, South Africa being the same. So this means that they must be handled and disposed of in a specific manner to protect against public health and the environment. Now, to give you an idea is when my device was replaced and I request to have the device that was in my body that I paid for, because it's a regulated industry within the Scandinavian area, I could not receive my device because it's a biohazard. So for that reason, the medical examiners by law have to contact um, the medical manufacturer to handle these devices as medical waste. Now, in terms of GDPR specifically or HIPAA, we're dealing with privacy situation. We're dealing with sensitive patient information. Now this information, whether a patient is passed on or not, they do retain the right to privacy and therefore the devices are destroyed to ensure that there's no leakage of data that potentially contravenes privacy laws. Now, the devices are destroyed by the manufacturers after they've assessed and evaluated the performance and functionality. Now, it's important to note the performance and functionality, not the actual medical data that's on there. So in terms of whether or not the manufacturer could give expert testimony on what exactly happened on the device, they can only answer for the fact that the performance and the functionality of the device was not compromised but only to an extent because it doesn't have robust, robust logging. It has got medical data logging, but not device logging itself. Now, after the basics reports have been pulled, in this case, the device was destroyed. This is a standard practice. There's nothing that they've done incorrectly. It is more so the process that is flawed because medical devices are not considered digital evidence, but rather bio waste. So this is all done under the guise of safeguarding patient information, as well as finding out when devices have actually ceased to work. So now I might get asked, well, what do you propose the process should be? You say that it's flawed. Well, yes, I do. Now, if we start shifting our mindsets for medical devices being something that you know is life-sustaining to something that is potentially of evidential value, one starts to look at it slightly different. Now, if you had to compare an implanted cardiac device to anything, one could compare it to the likes of a mobile phone, a smartwatch, or something that is memory-based. It is consistent of memory pages with specific data that is recorded in specific areas. Now, every manufacturer is different. Therefore, it's not always easy to just dump the data out as traditional forensic processes to look at them. 
and it would require some additional steps to be taken. But in an ideal world, the medical device should be treated as digital evidence, which means correctly the manufacturer should be called to remove the data under supervision from a digital forensics pr practitioner or medical examiner or a law enforcement agent to preserve chain of custody. The device should not be removed and destroyed, but rather kept in safekeeping. Now, as a defense expert, one of the things I wanted was additional reports because you do get the opportunity to have maintenance reports on these devices. Unfortunately, we weren't afforded the opportunity as the device was destroyed and only the single clinical report was pulled. Now, in the US specifically, that allows for a Brady defense, which means the client did not have the, you know, his right to have a defense or to look at the evidence against him um, was contravened. Um, and that was one of the things that was raised within the court case. Now, one should also understand that these devices need to be stored safely, which could be in a Faraday container, but they should be treated like mobile phones because they suffer from similar vulnerabilities as well as similar constraints. The most important thing here is there was no chain of evidence. Now, because we were heavily reliant on the evidence from the device and did not want it excluded, um, we did not follow the process of actually attacking the process of them receiving the information or the fact that it has been um, destroyed. As I said to you, it's not anything that they've done that is wrong. Uh, the FDA dictates that that is what is supposed to happen with medical devices. Um, once this is done, you can do a forensic acquisition on these devices. They are slightly different. If you wanted the raw information, you would get this from a PDB file, which is the programming, programming database. Now, contained in this is all the programming data files. So this includes settings, logs, informations, therapies, patient information, when the device was programmed, how it was programmed, and when it was updated, as well as firmware. So the PDB file, or your programming database file, is the file that contains all this information. However, you need to know that that information is in raw binary format, which needs to be then transposed into a readable format. Now, it's not as easy just to insert a PDB and out comes the, the information. Every manufacturer has a unique PDB file and a unique structure for reconstructing it. But this is something that only the manufacturer currently can do. So even though we do not want the manufacturer involved in a large amount of mechanisms, they unfortunately have to be part of this. And these devices are a bit of a niche. They are a little bit different, and you have to have an engineering background to look at this. Now, my hope for the future is that biomedical technologists will start and take up a forensic, pro, you know, forensic role and start to do these things more and more in the field. Now, I published a paper on medical device forensics because it baffled me that we didn't have a clear definition. I have been buying devices on eBay for the last six years, hacking them and doing forensics on them to determine what they commonly suffer from and how I need to forensically acquire it so that I can understand the forensic process. And it became glaringly obvious that general digital forensics, whilst it applies, is not perhaps the best way. So I came up with a triangle approach. Now a triangle in engineering is the strongest shape you can get and it felt fitting to have a similar process. Now we started with our medical device engineering um, and we have our digital forensics and medical forensics. And this is what made up the definition that I published. Um, so medical device engineering for this perspective is used to investigate the failures and this can range from serviceability to catastrophic failures. So we use this to debug devices. We use this to determine if a device has been working. And often we also use this for acquisition purposes. It takes a little bit of engineering knowledge to understand how to get this information um, over S, you know, SPI or JTAG or UART. So that's where the engineering component comes through. And it's always good to have specifically if you're gonna be focusing on medical devices um, in the future. Now, digital forensics is nothing new. It's the old kid on the block. And this comes around reconstructing a sequence of events that have taken place over a time frame. Now, I did make use of digital forensics to do the timeline analysis in this case, and specifically to reconstruct what's happened. 
Uh, I wanted to answer things like who, what, where, why, and when, and fill in the gaps of exactly what happened to our victim um, prior to passing away and at the time of death. Then we have medical forensics, which is often not done by someone that doesn't have any medical training. And this is, this is the examination of medical information to understand uh, the cause of injury or death. Now, again, this is largely used by medical examiners or physicians that do medical lawsuits or malpractice lawsuits. But if you take all three of these things together, you get medical device forensics, which is engineering, Friends, digital forensics, as well as understanding medically how these devices function. Now, the next question that I've been asked, well, Veronica, how accurate is this data? You're saying that this data is, you know, you are relying heavily in your testimony upon that. Now, if we consider anything that is bold, there is the chance that it will not work. But in like in most things, there has to be varied variables that have to be met for a device to stop working. When these devices are designed, they are designed to be highly accurate. There is approximately a 1% chance that a medical device will fail. Now, specifically these ones that are implanted in our chests, they often deal with signal losses and problems with communicating or can suffer damage and violent attacks. However, most of these are built to last 15 years. They are built to survive the test of time, albeit maybe not the security to last forever, but the actual hardware is designed to keep a human being alive for over 15 years sometimes. So it is likely like in everything that medical devices can fail. In this case, there was nothing that alluded to the fact that that was the probability that occurred. Now, this data is highly reliable for medical professionals. And if you take this in context with the specific victim's background, we will see that what he suffered from was something that he suffered from in the past. The only difference here is something occurred to place him under tourists and something occurred to make his heart stop. Now, if you read the medical examiner report, you will know that that was a shot to the head. But I don't know if you're aware, but you do not always automatically pass away from this. Now, why do I say these devices are fairly built to last? Well, if we look at the general CII triad, you all know confidentiality, integrity, and accessibility. You will find that medical devices are required to be confidential. They are required to have you know, personal, identifiable, and health information stored securely. Integrity is very important for these devices because they need to run even when interrupted. Now, the interesting fact that most people don't know about these devices, even when the device is bricked, it will go back to VVI mode, which is the baseline mode where it will beat at approximately 65 beats per minute. So the device never really switches off unless it's a catastrophic battery failure it will have a mode that it switches to even when the battery is almost depleted. So this means that integrity is very much important on these devices. Now, accessibility is another one that often comes up. And I say to people, usernames and passwords are not very viable on these devices, and this is what makes them weak. But one needs to consider the perspective from medical personnel and patients. I certainly don't want to be having trouble with my device and having to give the doctor the username and password. I would rather them just be able to authenticate no matter where I am in the world and give me the treatment needed. So these devices do have universal tokens or authentication models. But this device has to be accessible and responsive at all times. So as you can see, this means that these devices are quite reliable in terms of the data that they have. Okay. Now I was asked whether I can estimate the time of death. Now, again, I could potentially do this. And if we put things together, like the overall picture, we are able to kind of have a window. Now, is this window 100% accurate? No, because if we use the evidence in isolation, we aren't able to corroborate it. So we know, just to recap, that something's happened to our victim at approximately 921. They placed his heart in stress. We don't know what it is. We can hypothesize what it is, but we have no factual evidence. We know that the ICD switched mode to administer treatment for atrial fibrillation. 
for about 20 minutes. We knew that shortly after that he had a supraventricular episode that lasted for a minute. He received two shocks, which we can see on the ECG. And we also know that the device's last electrical activity recorded was at 10. So this means that prior to 921, some things occurred. Um, whether that is an altercation, whether it's nothing, we don't know. And we know that potentially he ceased to have any electrical activity at 10. So in terms of if we have to go according to the window, it, for me, it starts at 921 to 10. Um, which is slightly different than the liver temperature. Now, which one is correct? Well, we need to find a middle ground and we don't have enough evidence to accurately def definitively say who is more correct. Because both have scientific merits, both have got literature in some forms and some have some case precedent. So let's look a little bit about how our timeline has now developed. We see um, something has happened prior to 921. We see our events we saw where the patient has been shocked. We see that our suspect was recorded you know, at 9.55, so prior to time of death, buying drugs in a different location, which puts some question into whether or not he did the shooting. Now, could he have done the shooting? Well, his ankle bracelet only really places him in the crime scene at 10.48. And we know that the victim has potentially died at 10. So if we look at this, we now start seeing that the suspect is potentially, his story is potentially plausible. Now, again, it's not for me to decide whether or not he is guilty, that is for the court. But in terms of probable doubt, I think in this case, we introduce probable doubt in the fact that the suspect was unlikely to have committed the shooting. Now, these are just some of the questions that I was asked and the answers to those questions, as I just explained. We know that these devices are reliable in terms of dates and time, specifically in these circumstances. We know that technically they cannot detect the time of death, but we can identify when the electri electrical activity ceased in the heart when they were last recorded. We also know that although the processes that were followed were flawed, they are current practices and they are current best practices. Therefore, in terms of that, they did what they needed to do according to the processes they have. We know that these devices are highly accurate as they are built to be reliable and to function as expected. We also know that there was nothing wrong with the device specifically and it was functioning beautifully as it should. Now we did place, we did create the time window and we did place our suspect nowhere near the crime scene and it was proposed to have a new window of time. Now, there are ethical considerations within any case that uses medical data. Now, one might say, well, he's, you know, he's on trial. He doesn't have any ethical considerations. Yes, perhaps not for him, but you need to understand that there are constraints around these things that aren't considered. Now, up our victim has died. However, he still has a right to privacy. He still has a right to not have his information disclosed. And the same being said, when the suspect has a medical device that's implanted, they have a right to have their privacy maintained, specifically in the EU. And you will see when I go through some of the case, cases that I have found that the EU don't actually disclose who the case was about publicly because it contains privacy-related information. Informed consent is another ethical consideration within this field that we are discussing, that when a patient receives a device that is needed to save their life, like in this case an ICD or myself having an ICD, we don't ever have informed consent that the device will be accessed or the information on the device could potentially use in criminal investigations. So if you take in consideration the ethics around that, it is very questionable to actually make use of these devices. Because at the time when we receive it, whilst under duress, whilst stress, whilst just wanting to live, there is no informed consent in terms of how the data potentially down the line can be used. And then we talk a little bit about confidentiality, right? There is a right to confidentiality of healthcare related information. Now, if one, if this information is used within a criminal matter, there can be confidentiality issues. 
it could also force the doctor of the patient to actually break the trust relationship between him and his patient to give testimony into what data is on the device. One can argue that it's not very fair or just to make use of ICD or pacemaker data. Now, if we think about the fact that it is used in this case to actually prove the innocence, but what if it was used against you, the device that is there to keep you alive, that you have no other choice than to have, that is the ultimate keylogger or recording of where you go, what is going on in your heart, what is going on in your health, are you running where you have been? Is it fair and just to use this information within criminal matters where the patient or the individual with the device hasn't had informed consent? There's also not a lot of precedent or legal context where this has been used. So this is a fairly new realm, which means that we are going to be making mistakes. We are kind of paving, paving the way for how this is used. Now, I wanted to look at the global picture of cases because I needed to research this to determine whether or not going forward with this case in the US was actually viable. So let's look at cases in the UK, which I included due to the fact that Plymouth being in the UK. To my surprise, I found a few cases within the UK that are similar or in some way are similar that have been used where medical data from implants have been used. We have the case in 2013 of State Stephen Seden that was convicted of murdering his parents. Now, it was alleged that they had an accident in the car. Um, both his you know, elderly parents had medical devices and they were able to look at this information from the victim to determine what the heart rates were and whether they were active or moving. Now, what showed on both the victims is that when the time they went into the canal, they were alive. Now, this does not match initially what was thought to have happened. Um, and it also showed that there was duress earlier on. They used some of this information in corroboration with other information to effectively you know, convict Stephen Seden of the murder of his parents. Now, there's another case in 2018 where, you know, a doctor was actually convicted of manslaughter, specifically when the pacemaker information was used in court. It was shown that during heart surgery on the victim, the heart stopped during the procedure, um, which contravened the story that the surgeon told the courts at that time. And it was found that he was you know, he was guilty of manslaughter due to the evidence from the pacemaker data showing exactly when the victim's heart stopped. Now, in 2019, we have Cole Beach that was convicted of perverting the court of justice because he falsely claimed to be part of a child abuse ring. However, when they examined his pacemaker, they found that he was not present at any of the locations where he claimed the abuse has taken place which means that these devices do keep some location data and has the ability to be correlated with a mobile phone to determine exactly where you've been at a given time. Now, the case of Sally Chalin, where she was convicted of the murder of her husband. Initially, the case was tried in 2001 and later overturned in 2019. The device, you know, the information from his implanted heart monitor was used to record the date heart rate and activity levels and it was showed that he had an increase in heart rate and tried to move when he was killed with a hammer which contradicted the initial claim that she was acting in self-defense um, because of the activity levels not showing him moving um, it, it cast a doubt on her story that it was enough to convict her of now, you'll see that the U.S. has used it fairly differently, not quite the same, where in the U.K. it was used in, you know, using other data in substance to what they've had. In the U.S., however, we have James Bates that was charged with murder. Um, they used an echo device um, as well as his friend's pacemaker to actually show that his friend died at a very specific time that helped him establish the time of death, putting him in the room with his friends. So that Amazon Echo device was used to have, to have the recordings of when he was with his friend, and they correlated that with the time of death. 
Then we have the arson and insurance fraud case in Ohio that made quite a lot of um, newsworthy articles. The prosecutor used the data from the pacemaker to show that she was in fact not asleep as she claimed she was, and that she was actually the one that was responsible for destroying her home with additional information. Now, these devices have got the ability to tell whether you're sitting, standing, or moving, um, as well as in conjunction with heart rates, you can start building a picture of exactly what someone was doing at a specific time. Now, um, we also have a murder case that this was used in, and this was used to establish the time of death um, of when she were, the victim was attacked in her home. Now, the UK, US published these publicly. Um, however, in the EU, if you are in cybersecurity, you know we deal with the dreaded GDPR. Now, GDPR states that specifically cases where instances of pacemaker ICD data or healthcare information has been used, these cases do not get actually publicly, the people don't get publicly identified due to privacy concerns and legal restrictions. So this meant that the cases that I'm going to be giving you is at a high level and doesn't actually identify the people involved. And this is just because of the strict data protection laws that we have in the EU. Germany, there was a case against where they helped convict a man, you know, committing arson. And again, it was used to show that the man's heart significantly increased at the time of the fire, which is consistent with him setting the fire. And here what they did was profiling in terms of how cardiac activity looks when someone is stressed or when someone is excited and correlating this with other evidence, they found the time of when the fire was set. Now in the Netherlands, they used pacemaker data to help convict a man of murder. They used the data to actually show that the man's heart rate spiked significantly when he attacked the victim. Um, and this shows us that when someone kills someone, there is a, you know, there is an interaction with the heart. Looking at these cases, that is what led me to believe that the two events that we saw on the ECGs, on the, you know, ICD device was potentially from something that occurred just prior. Now, this was confirmed by an electrophysiologist, as I felt that, that was outside my realm of expertise. Um, but we do hypothesize that that was kind of the window in which the person got shot. Now, Denmark used it as well to convict a murderer. And specifically, this was done to determine when the electrical activity ceased within the heart. Now, these are kind of just briefly touching on what goes on in the life of medical devices and legalities. This is a very, very new field. Um, we are still looking into some research into how we can use this more accurately to determine time of death, um, what the best process would be for dealing with these devices and changing the way that the legal system views these devices in terms of the biohazard regulations. And that is all I have for you today. And I welcome any questions that you might have. Oh, oh. sorry. Oh. Thank you very much, Veronica. Sorry, questions. Yeah, Nathan might have questions. I've got a few. Veronica, I wonder if you'd like to stop sharing the screen. I can see people there. Perfect. Uh, so, a couple of questions to start with, and then I'll leave it to others to, to ask if they've got any. And, um, Veronica, I was just interested, obviously, you focus on medical devices.